I reaffirm that the national life of Canada will not permit any large degree of immigration from Asia. I intend to stand up absolutely on all occasions on this one great principle of white country and white British Columbia. In 1914, the Komagata Maru entered the Brard Inlet. It was carrying 376 passengers, mostly Punjabi Sikh, but there were also Hindus and Muslims on board. They're told that they can't enter the country. As the time went by, two months in the water, the passengers were falling sick. They were starving and also they were thirsty. No food or water was supplied to them, no medication. 60 full days, essentially, uh, sitting there living within the confines of the ship. Uh, Kamagata Maru was sent back to India forcefully. Upon their arrival, they're greeted by the British Indian Army. British to shot the passengers. Several of them passed away. Some of them are imprisoned. Including my grandfather. My great uncle. My grandfather's cousin. And my uh, grandfather. Uh, hard to believe you know, how they have gone through all this. That's my grandfather, right here. As you can see, all these passengers are uh, wearing suits. So they basically, they were uh, trying to show that they are Westerns. It was my great-grandfather's little brother. So he was, the, he was one of the passengers on the ship that got denied and had to go back to India, unfortunately. My great-uncle had a very hard time on the boat. Um, obviously, just being docked and not let off for two months uh, was in, in itself very difficult after such a long journey. My grandfather used to tell me uh, his experience with the Komagata Maru in incident, a painful experience. They were all the British subjects, because British were ruling India, uh, uh, India and also in Canada. So they were all British subjects. Uh, they were uh, actually legally entering the Canada. But when they came over here, uh, Canadian government denied entry them. He got a university degree, but anything higher than that, he can only achieve either in the United States or in Canada. So when ship was leaving for Canada, so we jumped on that ship. They were very happy coming to Canada. They had a $200 head tax. They had their British passport. So who could stop them? A charter by the name of Baba Gurdet Singh was an Indian businessman living in Singapore. He uh, saw an opportunity, a business opportunity, to open up a passageway between Vancouver uh, and, and South Asia uh, to establish shipping routes. Canada passes this law in 1908, the Continuous Journey Regulation, that is really a loophole uh, because they can't stop immigrants coming from India to Canada because migration throughout the British Empire is supposed to be open and uh, available to all subjects of the British. The Continuous Journey Regulation was the racist regulation that kept the passengers from the community from the Komagatamaru out of Canada. Uh, the, the Continuous Journey Regulation was on the books in 1908 and it basically stated that passengers must travel from their place of origin to the place of landing in one continuous journey. Uh, at one point you actually have the Prime Minister, Wilford Laurie at the time, uh, say that to keep Canada white, Canadians and the government has the moral authority to keep people who they deem to be physically, morally and intellectually unfit out of Canada. Our community was committed to that we should live in this country. The nations who forget the deeds of their elders are desolated. A funny little anecdote, the, the person who was the immigration officer that was saying that you can't enter the country was Cyclone Taylor, uh, the very famous hockey player who's the, who was the captain of the Vancouver Millionaires at that time. 
Uh, he actually spoke about uh, what they call the Hindus and Hindustanis as immoral, as undesirable, as unfit, as not good enough to be citizens and to be Canadian citizens. Um, so the continuous journey regulation was designed with this ideology in mind, this ideology of keeping Canada white forever, this ideology of seeing uh, people of colour as polluted, right? And, and there's something that's so derogatory and harmful about that that we don't often speak about. And when we talk about the Komagata Maru, we talk about the racism, but we don't talk about how insidious it was. We don't talk about how deeply embedded it was um, in the systems and in the regulations uh, that we have on the book. The social political atmosphere in Canada at that time, um, I mean the most telling thing is uh, a popular song that was sung at bars uh, at that time was the song White Canada Forever. And it was really reinforced by governments at, at multiple levels. The same kind of fear mongering that happens today around migrants stealing jobs and that kind of nasty toxic rhetoric was existing at that time. Even Vancouver City was, the municipality was one who objected. They were called Hindus. Actually, it was a mayor at that time. He was the one who refused her. Mayor Baxter at the time, I think he was the 16th mayor of Vancouver, spoke about keeping Canada white and keeping Canada a white man's country. We also know that he uh, had organized an anti-Asian rally in, in the city of Vancouver uh, and really spoke, and this really speaks to um, the desire to, to keep people of colour out of the city. Harry Stephen spoke in the, uh, there was 2,000 crowd were there uh, and, uh, and he spoke against the Kamangata Moro passengers. He stated, we want to keep the Canada white and British Columbia white. Uh, you know, this is a threat to their uh, white community here. South Asian community and First Nation community also provide the uh, uh, passengers with food and water. Even that was limited because the Canadian government official restricted the uh, community, South Asian community and the First Nation community uh, to assess the ship. But they did try their best. A few hundred uh, officers and immigration department officials entered the Burrard Inlet in the middle of the night and tried to remove the Kamagata Maru by force. Uh, the passengers fight, fight them off. They fight them off with whatever they can. Uh, that's, that's bricks, that's coals, that's barrels, just heaving them. Everybody's a story. I know, uh, when I say the passenger itself is a st one story. You know, in my uh, life, I've spent days sleeping on the roads, footpaths. Day, had a food in the morning, didn't have food in the evening. I've been through this in my, I was only 20, 21 at that time. So I know those hardships, how much they have suffered over there. I try really hard to think about the humanity of each person, uh, to celebrate what moments of intimacy, of happiness, of empathy, of celebration. How do they keep their spirits up? Because we know that they had instruments and they sang together and they sang ballads uh, that invoked history. In India, Komagata Maru represents the Indian people's struggle for independence and was the turning point in India's freedom movement because people got the true picture that what British are telling them is not true. In Canada, it is a reminder of a policy of exclusion, racism, that for Sikhs and other immigrants from India lasted for half a century. We can't undo the past, but we can move a forward and leave a legacy for the future generations by educating them about the past. Apology doesn't make you smaller. It, it actually reflects your personality. I don't know what our lives would have been like had he actually been allowed here and my family started here quite early. You know, that's lost history. Every individual's existence matters. Every individual story matters. The bigger stories are the easier ones to recognize. Therefore, it's our job to investigate, 
to explore, to reimagine, to interrogate the histories that we know and that we don't know.